Jimmy Murphy, Pierre Maguire here for another edition of the Eye Test on the Sick Podcast Network. Turn up your volume because you're about to listen to the Sick Podcast. The Eye Test with Pierre Maguire and Jimmy Murphy. The Stanley Cup winning Colorado Avalanche. And after 22 years, Raymond Mark! The sickest NHL podcast. It's going to be sick. Hey, Jimmy Murphy here, back with Pierre Maguire for another episode of the Eye Test on the Sick Podcast Network. And Pierre, I- I'm I'm still basking in the glow of our last episode. I don't know about you, uh, just... You know, one of those pinch me moments, and I appreciate you setting it up. What an interview we had with Scotty Bowman, huh? Yeah, pretty amazing, Jimmy, when you really think about it. And uh, the wealth of knowledge that Scotty is, number one. And number two, the people that have actually watched it and reached out to us and said, I can't believe what I learned from Scott and all, all the different life lessons, hockey lessons, really important things that really help coaches. Uh, I'm sitting in Hamilton, New York right now. Mike Carter's the new coach of Colgate mm-hmm. University. It's a huge college hockey weekend for a lot of teams. Colgate Cornell, that's like the Hatfield and McCoys. It's a whole lot of nasty. Awesome. And so the fact that Coach Harder's allowed me to use his office here, uh, I'm really grateful. But the first thing he said to me, man, I learned so much from that Bowman interview. It was awesome. So that's just one example. And I know you have a ton and I have a ton. And Scotty, we're just so grateful. And I know you watch all of them. Thank you so much, Scotty. Yeah, thank you, Scotty. And I'll tell you quickly, too, you know, reading through the comments uh, on our YouTube page and a, uh, a a fan from Montreal who apparently grew up, uh, you know, he grew up around in Kirkland, it says. Uh, and he said he used to go to games with his dad. And he said that had me that reminded me of my dad and had me in tears throughout the whole episode. So. It, it, it's it's great to make a connection like that. And Mike, the uh, fan, we appreciate you. Listen, we appreciate all our viewers. And, you know, that's what we're here for. And uh, and Scotty has a way of doing that every time he's on with, whether it's with us, whether it's with you elsewhere uh, on any radio channel, he, he's just great. And it, Pierre, it's just the, the, the way he can just sit there and crank out the stories one after another, one after another. It, it's It's amazing. Well, it's not just hockey lessons. It's life lessons, Jimmy. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things he always told me, this is before cellular phones came out. He used to say to me all the time, Pierre, the most important thing every day, it's not the breakout. It's not the power play. It's not the penalty kill. It's not the lineup. It's did you reach home? Did you call your family today before the game? And he used to say that all the time. Just little things like that. And it really does matter a lot. It does. It does. And, you know, look. We're going to talk uh, today. We're really excited. We've got another great guest coming on soon at 1.45. Uh, well, our time will record this. Um, Greg Carvel from UMass Amherst. Of course, you guys know him, a UMass alum. So very excited about that. And he's done a wonderful job uh, getting that program up and running. And we're also going to talk right now, though, Pierre, on the NHL level, about rebuilds. And, you know, both of us, well, I, I a little more closer than you last night, we're looking at the San Jose-Boston game. And, of course, the San Jose Sharks at the bottom of the standings. Very evident. They made it clear they're going into a rebuild. Um, and then we're going to kind of compare compare and contrast them to the Montreal Canadiens because we're looking at the San Jose Sharks, and you and I were talking about this in our prep work for today. And, you know, you, you know you're not going to be a good team. You know you're going to be at the bottom of the standings when you're in a rebuild. But you also want to keep morale up. You also want to – Stay competitive. And, you know, if not for uh, a good second period by the Bruins, I mean, San Jose just wasn't in that game. Like, you know, I I look at it, I'm not trying to be extreme here, but I look at it and say the way they played for most of that game, there's some top AHL teams that would have competed with them and maybe taken a victory. And you don't want that to be the case, especially when you're developing younger players and trying to build their confidence at the pro level. And I guess as I asked you you know, off the air, I'm going to ask you here now, mm-hmm. how do you find that balance, Pierre, where you, you maybe reach a point and you say, I know we're in a rebuild, but we can't lose like this. You know, when you start a rebuild, everybody's excited. Usually there's a new GM, there's a new coaching staff. There's new energy around the team, Jimmy, Mm -hmm. and everybody's excited. And you usually get a honeymoon or a grace period. 
And in San Jose, they had that last year, for sure. They had that last year. They had 22 wins last year, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. They're almost at the, you know, quarter way through the season this year. They've got five wins. Yeah. So when you look at it and you're trying to be forthright, you say, okay, does ownership support this rebuild now? We're almost a year and a bit in. Right. Does the general manager feel comfortable with the type of rebuilding they're doing? Is the coaching staff happy with the players that they have the ability to coach right now? And do the players feel comfortable with the entire messaging throughout the entire organization? And if the answer to all those things is mm, lukewarm, chances are the rebuild's not going very well. If the answers are, yeah, we're really comfortable, we knew this is the way it was going to be, and so we can ride it out, that's great. And this is when it all falls apart. When the fan base quits on your rebuilding ideas, you got a problem. I'm not saying that's happened in San Jose because uh, I don't believe it has. But you're getting close to where the fans say, whoa, wait a second. How long is this really going to be? You know, Eric Carlson is playing in Pittsburgh. Brent Burns is playing in Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, Mark Edward Vlasic is not the same player he was. I know that Mike Greer inherited ter terrible, terrible cap situations there. They've had injury situations, obviously, to Logan Couture and to Thomas Hurtle. So they've got issues. Um, but the truth is, Jimmy, when you're doing a rebuild, if you don't start to see results probably by a year and a half to two, you start to wonder how long is the patience going to be internally for this to work out properly. It, my question to you now then is, you know, look, you look at David Quinn behind the bench there, right? He comes in, okay, he knows we're not – my job isn't necessarily to rack up points and wins – it's, it's to develop these kids. It's to get, push this along, move it along. But at what point do you say, well, yeah, you got to get some wins. You got to get moral wins. You, you got to get, you know, character performances. And I look at that team, Pierre, and, you know, I'm just looking at last night in that one game. And with the exception of Giovanni Smith, who I thought was playing great, I, he was a wrecking ball. He was running all over the place. He's creating havoc. He was trying to jumpstart his team. You could see it. It was very clear. He was trying to provide a spark, but nobody's grabbing onto that spark and nobody's running with it. So when does it start to go behind the bench if you're the GM, if you're the evaluators? Well, one of the things that's really important throughout this entire process, daily positive communication and honest communication between the general manager and the coach. I can't believe they wouldn't. They're both Boston University guys. David and Michael have known each other a very long time. Right. I think there's a comfort level there that they're not afraid to share ideas and structure with one another, which is great. Once that starts, and if it ever, it hasn't yet, but if it ever started to break down, Jimmy, that's where you're going to have a problem. Right. And so that's why I, this is unfair to, to David, by the way, David Quinn. That's not a good team. I mean, on paper, it's not a good team, and it's not a good team on the ice. The one thing I'll say, though, the guys work – they work hard. Now, that's the start of an East Coast road trip. They're in New Jersey tonight. Not going to be easy for them there. Um, Jersey's starting to get going. You can see that. They get Nico yeah. Heischer back. They get Jack Hughes back, and they're starting to go again, and everybody kind of sees that. But the problem is you get into the holiday season, and this is a tough time of the year for teams when they're not winning. Mm -hmm. And so it falls apart real quick when you're not winning around the holidays. And I would think at some point here, they're going to have to have something happen to bring in some more energy to that group if it continues the way it is right now. Great segue there. So then I, my next question was going to be, okay, so do you look back down into the well in the AHL or even, you know, as we get further in a year, maybe in March, when you're, some of your college prospects are, you know, their season's ending and you can you can sign them do you do that or is that is that walking that fine line where you don't want to rush those kids? You're maybe, in my opinion, I don't know if you'll agree with me, but you're maybe better off to let them develop. Don't dive into that yet because you could end up ruining them as well. So let's just use the San Jose Barracudas, their American Hockey League franchise right now. San Diego, they're in last place in their division. Bakersfield is second to last place. And San Jose is in third to last place. So they're not teaming with elite prospects in the American Hockey League either. So that's something you have to evaluate when you're going through it too. So by the way, just again, to be fair, San Diego is Anaheim's farm team and Bakersfield is Edmonton's farm team. So just again, 
trying to be fair through this whole thing. Yes. Um, look, <laughs> this is hard. Will, I would think, and I, I'm not an evaluator for San Jose, but I would think Will Smith, who's playing at Boston College, is probably their best prospect in their eyes right? Uh, going forward. And and he's a tremendous – you can talk to Greg Brown, who we had on last we week. Already had, yeah. You know, Will Smith is an amazing prospect. He's outstanding. He's an A-plus level prospect. Right. But to your point, do you rush him right away? Mm -hmm. Do you bring him in after his freshman year? I would say probably not. Probably not. So, so okay, I'm, I'm Mike Greer right now then. You don't want to do that, right? You just said the cupboard's empty pretty much down at the AHL level. Do you start letting GMs right now? Because we're starting to see movement on the trade market. We just saw a trade uh, on Thursday. Zadaroff goes to Vancouver. Um, so teams, teams are willing to start to wheel and deal a bit, and I think a little earlier than maybe we expected, but it's happening. Do you start – Talking to your pro scouts that are scouting those AHL games, right? Gather them right now. Maybe it doesn't happen before Christmas or before the new year, right? But would it behoove Mike Greer to really have a brainstorming meeting with his pro scouts that focus on AHL games and say, okay, who are we seeing out there that if, if I'm willing to deal a veteran that could be the final piece to another team that's competing for, the, for a playoff spot or competing for the cup, who am I looking at as AHL guys to bring in here to start to build up that system down there because we're really empty? Is that how you would approach it? I think, well, I think that's fair to say. You always want to have character in your organization. You know, you talked about it when we opened here about the interview that Scotty Bowman gave us uh, on yeah. Wednesday. Remember what he said, how important character was, how important your bottom six forwards were. You can't win without that character. Yeah, you can't win I love that. that was one of my favorite forwards. parts of the show. Yeah. It, it's <laughs> That comes down to why this show is called what it is. It's the eye test. Yes. There's no analytic equation that can measure that character that those guys have to have that are bottom six role players because they sacrifice a lot for the team and they sacrifice a lot of money because they're not going for points. They're doing mm -hmm. what the coach asked them to do. Um, all that being said, I think they do. And it's not just San Jose, by the way. I just want to be totally oh, yeah. clear. Here. This is not a, an indictment of the San Jose Sharks. I think every team that's looking to get better has to have an infusion of character, no matter whether it's at the American Hockey League level, at the NHL level. And character usually brings, not always, but usually brings energy, and it usually brings positivity. And, and when you're going through a rebuild, you need energy and you need positive energy. All right, so let's look on the flip side because I think they're doing a great job at everything we just discussed here, and that's the Montreal Canadiens and Jeff Gordon and Kent Hughes. And before we get into this, too, I want to ask you, too, we saw when they bring Jeff Gordon and Kent Hughes in, Montreal had long been a team that always, I don't know if recycled might be a strong word, but they were very open to always bringing in alumni. And, and keeping it in-house when they, you know, they hire GMs or assistant GMs or coaches. It's always guys that had these Canadians connections. And I thought one of the boldest and bravest, okay, just based on the market he's in, moves by Jeff Molson were those hires when he brought in fresh faces, outside perspectives in Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon. And as I look at what we just discussed in San Jose, Nobody was brought in, maybe above isn't the word, but nobody was brought in in an advising position that was an outside voice from what the Sharks already had to maybe guide Mike Greer along in his first couple of years. And that's why I think, you know, that's the comparison there to me is that Montreal did that. And I think it's paying off in spades right now. Well, it is. The one thing I'd say in defense of San Jose, Timmy Burke is, an elite hockey person, and he's been there for a long time, and he's been there when they were really, right. really good. And the same can be said for Joe Will, who's the assistant general manager there. So, you know, again, I'm not going to knock San Jose because I know those men really well, and I respect them Agreed. a lot. They're really yeah. good hockey people. Yeah. So you talk about Montreal. The one thing I'd say is there was an experience factor with Jeff Gorton coming there because if you remember, he oh. helped author the rebuild letter that the New York Rangers – sent to their season ticket holders when the Rangers said, we're going to blow it up, we're going to tear it down, we're going to start over again. And Jeff was a big part of that, um, you know, along with John Davidson early on, and then eventually Chris Drury took it to the next step. So I give them all a lot of credit. 
but then you've hired Jeff in Montreal, which was a really shrewd move that you talked about, Jimmy, by Jeff Molson. And he brings in a guy that can help him maybe with what he's not comfortable. Jeff doesn't like dealing with the media. Good for him. He doesn't have to. He's a hockey guy. He's yep. not, I don't think any hockey person likes doing contracts. Well, most agents do. Ken Hughes is a great agent. And yep. most agents know the lower uh, prospect pool because they have that. Those are going to be their future clients. Exactly. So you've got that with Ken Hughes as well. So I, I think Montreal's done a good job. All that being said, I think Montreal also has about a year and a half head start on San Jose. And that's why I think they're a bit more competitive right now. I do. Well, listen, to be continued on this conversation, because I do yeah. find it intriguing and there's a lot of teams in those situations, but let's go down to a guy that's doing a great job of developing the prospects that both the San Jose Sharks and the Montreal Canadiens are, I'm sure, scouting. And that's the head coach of UMass Amherst. We have him right here. Greg Carville joining us right now. Hey, Coach, how you doing? Hey, Jimmy. Good. How are you? Hey, Pierre. Hi, Coach. Good, Good to see, see you. you. Good to see you up in uh, Burlington yet? We are in Burlington. We uh, we beat winter. It's still pretty warm. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, it can be a crapshoot when you're driving up that way up, uh, you know, 89 once you get into that area. But yeah, I heard it's been pretty, it's been pretty nice so far. So, uh, Coach, uh, you look, I'm going to let you and Pierre take this over in a bit, but I just want to say, currently, what's been your take on this season so far? Uh, our team got back to our identity. We, we got away from it last year and uh, with the help of the portal, which is good and bad for for teams, uh, we were able to make some adjustments, uh, brought in a lot of talented freshmen, which are playing important roles for us. We got bigger uh, on our back end, which was important, and our goaltending stabilized. So we, we addressed a lot of issues, and they, they went in a positive manner so far. Good stuff. Well, Pierre, I know you want to talk about Coach's journey to UMass Amherst and how he got there, so let's go. Well, first of all, I just want to build off his last answer. Greg, you know, I love what you said about the portal and about the freshmen coming in. When you identified players in the portal, how much did character come into play when you were trying to bring them to UMass? Yeah, so in the portals, what were we, three or four years into the portal, the first couple of years we went after a certain type of player and gave them a lot of scholarship, and we did not get the return on investment that we were hoping for. And we, we made an adjustment. We we decided we we needed some older, high character kids. Uh, we got two or we have four grad transfers. I think two were captains on their teams. Maybe three were. Uh, Sammy Niansari from Brown has been a huge addition to us. Liam Gorman, uh, I believe, wore a letter in uh, Princeton, and Lucas Van Roboys has been a, a great addition as well. They're all older, bigger, physically strong, experienced players. So they they give they've helped us stabilize things. So when I helped bring you to St. Lawrence University, we didn't need you to stabilize things, but the one thing you always had was high character and high level of hockey IQ. When you're recruiting and evaluating players, Greg, do you think back to the way you played and the way you carried yourself around the rink? Yeah, I, you want players that have a certain amount of commitment and integrity, and I felt like that was the way I, I carried myself. But uh, we need players with a lot more skill than I had. And uh, – a lot more finished so but the character part has always been a foundational thing for us uh our, our goal at umass is to bring in the highest character kids and push them as hard as we can and squeeze every bit of potential out of them and uh, the equation works pretty well for us jimmy i just got to tell you right now he's underselling himself with skill he was a draft pick of the pittsburgh penguins and i only know that because scotty bowman and i helped draft him into pittsburgh so it's not like coach Carvel didn't have any skill he had more than enough skill uh to play so stop underselling yourself that's the only message i'm going to give you today now one thing i will say you were a canton kid that went back to st lawrence and you helped keep the legacy alive for a lot of great teams do you think back on that now and say maybe that's how I jump started my career to being a coach? Because Greg, you could have done so many other things besides being a college coach. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. The truth, uh, you know, I, I worked hard in school, so I had Ivy, Ivy schools were an option for me. But at that time, I had too much loyalty to Joe Marsh, and uh, as you know, Pierre St. Lawrence was a national contender at that time, and uh, it wasn't easy. It was an easy decision for me. Uh, Joe, Joe is the ultimate players coach and they're having so much success there. And, I, and 
you know, kids who grow up in the same town as their college, it's kind of extreme. I think either they're, they're dying to go back and play for their home team or they have no interest at all. And I was a kid that wanted to do that. I wanted to go back and play. And, and Joe was a big pull and, and Pierre was the, the head recruiter in, in my situation. And it was, it was an easy decision. It's funny. I'm in UVM right now. I remember I was in Vermont on a, an official visit and they played St. Lawrence. Mm-hmm. And I told Pierre that night, so I'm coming to you guys. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so it's kind of funny here. 30 years later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my coaching career, you know, there's, there's a small number of people and, and Joe's probably number one. And Pierre is, is another one of those people that really influenced me. Um, I never, I never left hockey thinking I was going to be a head coach, but just you, you don't want to get away from the game if you don't have to. And just the connections that I have from St. Lawrence, uh, Ray Sherrill was very big part of me getting into pro hockey as was Joe and, and Pierre. So small group of St. Lawrence people really uh, helped direct my my profession, I guess. How hard was it for you to leave St. Lawrence and go to UMass, Greg? It, it was uh, heartbreaking. It was uh, the toughest decision that I ever made. Uh, uh, UMass, my, my wife is from Amherst, and we were mm-hmm. actually, as it, it was the end of the season, and we just went to visit her parents. And I was invited on campus to, to interview, and I was like, what the hell, I'm here, I'll, I'll go interview. And I was offered the job within a couple hours of the interview. Wow. And the AD wanted a decision. I kept pushing him back and pushing him back. I just didn't know what the right thing was to do. And there's a lot of tears. And uh, my heart was completely, you know, sewn in and, and, and at St. Lawrence. But I talked to enough people and I felt like we were kind of banging our heads on the on the ceiling. And uh, if I wanted to do bigger and better things, that it was probably what I needed to do. Um, and UMass really, really persuaded me. They showed me how much they wanted me. The chancellor of the university met me twice. Um, and, you know, just it was a very tough decision. And even you know, once I got there, we lost 29 games my first year. And you second guess a lot of things. But it's like anything. If you, if you have that commitment and integrity and, and put your put your heart and mind to it. Um, but I was also very fortunate. I hired some very good people who were very very helpful in turning things around. Well, one of the guys that helped you turn things around was a young defenseman that's playing for the Colorado Avalanche right now, mm-hmm. Kale McCarr. Can you take us through the intrigue that was Kale McCarr and how you got him to Amherst, Massachusetts? Yeah. Uh, he, he's obviously the most influential person in our program. He was recruited by the previous staff. There had been a bit of a pipeline from Bro- the Brooks Bandits to UMass. I think four or five, six kids uh, when I got there, had played at Brooks. So uh, the previous staff had done a great job in identifying Kale and did a good job to secure him when he was still, you know, five foot four and nobody, you know, cared much about him. Uh, when I took the job, when I called the, the Ryan Bamford and said, I'm going to take the job, the first thing out of his mouth was, you need to call Kale McCarr. And I didn't know who Kale McCarr was. Uh, I quickly learned um, and I, then I quickly got in a plane and I flew out to, uh, to Alberta to see him play and spend some time with him. And, uh, I mean, I know the family really well, um, Gary McCarr, we came close while Kale was there and now Taylor's here at UMass. Um, but I think what kept them at UMass was the fact that, you know, I coached Eric Carlson in Ottawa when he was 19 years old and I ran the defense for Eric's first two years. And I think Gary knew enough people in Hockey Canada who knew me who who recommended that that we could uh, we could help Kale and uh, and I believe we did. You know, Kale is ultra talented, but there's just talent is one thing. Learning how to play the game the right way, how to carry yourself as a professional, and, and Kale's a high high character kid, and and I use him a lot as an example because he was a he was the ultimate teammate too. You want to talk about a kid who was selfless, didn't want the spotlight shared everything with shared all success with his teammates he was the ultimate and uh beyond that what a pleasure to watch him practice every day and you know i've had a handful of players like that um where it's just you you know how special they are and uh i i really grateful and, and make sure that i enjoy like i have two great defensemen right now scotty morrow and ryan ufko who are tremendous college hockey players and i just love watching them play the game um, so Kale was uh, absolutely influential and influential in that, not just his skill, but his character helped us build a foundation 
uh, of success in our program. Jimmy, I have to tell you that six years ago, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer and I had a full prostatectomy. And uh, probably two weeks into my recovery, I got a call from Coach Carvel. He says, hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm sitting on my couch watching <laughs> hockey. I'm recovering from a pretty significant surgery. He goes, why don't you drive up and come watch our team practice and talk to our team? So I did. And wow. uh, one of the guys, obviously, that was there was Kale McCarr. And to just to back Coach Carvel's point up, Kale could have left after his freshman year, correct, Greg? Right? Could have left. He decided to stay. And him staying obviously made a big difference to UMass and to the entire program, but he knew he wasn't ready. It's the high character that Coach Carvel's talking about. But I'll never forget being at UMass for that one practice that day and watching him practice. And, and I said to Greg, I said, this guy's ready. He says, yeah, at the end of this year, he's not even now. <laughs> he went so good. But Greg, he did such a magnificent job with Kale. And, and for all the young players out there, sometimes it's better to stay the extra year. And Kale did that. And Greg, you can speak to it. Hobie Baker winner, national champion. And you and Kale were a big part of that, obviously. Yeah, you know, he's... He's the example we often use. Colorado did want to sign him after the first year. I mean, he was fourth pick overall. Most of those high picks don't stay more than a year in college. But Kale was very self-aware. And uh, I, I think physically he knew he knew it was in his best interest to stay another year. Even his first year in the NHL, I think uh, he was injured once or twice. And I think it's just – it's a grind. It's, it's a lot of hockey. And he was smart enough to know that. It's in his best interest, and and it's just the family's philosophy not to not to race to the next level, be overripe, uh, over ready. Um, I don't think Kale ever for a second he he knew he, he needed to come back, even as much as Colorado. And we saw that again last summer with uh, Scotty Morrow, who mm -hmm. uh, you know he's a high second round pick, and a little surprised that people are probably surprised he came back for third year. But Scotty's also very very self aware. He, you know, I meet with him weekly and he said to me one point, he said, I don't think I'm quite ready to take on McDavid yet. And I said, you're right. You're right, my friend. And uh, he's, <laughs> he's done a great job. His game's come a long way in, in the past year. Jimmy, I just want to add on to what Coach Carl said, because I've known Scott Morrow since he played for the mid Fairfield uh, when okay. he was probably eight or nine years old. And he went to the brick tournament with uh, the Connecticut Yankees. And, and I can tell you this, the growth that Scott Morrow's had at UMass under Coach Carvel and his staff has been amazing. Um, but here's a kid. This is, again, for young people that will be watching this later on. Here's a kid that was committed to another institution in the NCAA and decided, you know, maybe this isn't the right fit and chose to go to UMass. So just want people to be aware. You know, just if somebody doesn't take you, doesn't mean your career is over. Or if yes. you choose to go somewhere else, it doesn't mean your career is over. And I can't, I can't say enough good things about what Greg and his staff have done with Scott Morrow. Great. I want to ask you too, Coach, going back to, you know, your initial interviews when you're interviewing for the job there. Um, and obviously, Cal has helped the recruiting a lot. But going back to what you were telling the AD, telling the school of how you envision this hockey program becoming an established hockey program. Because, look, I went to UMass and for so many years it was a basketball school. And hockey was just an afterthought there. So when you came in there, what did you see? Like, what was your vision? What did you see that maybe others weren't seeing that you guys could be a top hockey school? I'll never forget. I was I was walking in. The AD asked me to meet him somewhere off campus. Just we were trying. I didn't want anyone to know I was interviewing. I was again very happy at St. Lawrence, and we were walking in the Mullins. And I'll never forget. I stopped. I said are you interviewing me or am I interviewing you? And he laughed <laughs> and we, we still laugh about it because I wasn't coming after the job. He was having to sell me. And, right. And uh, so our conversation was great. He just asked about how I built up the program at St. Lawrence. And it's, you know, just what I knew and what I would carry over. Um, what I think what really sold me is uh, a very good friend of mine and, and Pierre's Jack Arena, who is the he head coach at Amherst College in the same town, I, he's a very good friend of mine. Uh, and I called him and I said, what are your thoughts? And he goes, I think the program just needs the right people. All the resources are there. And uh, I think that carried the most weight with me along with really being persuaded by Bamford and, and our chancellor at the time 
just showing the kind of commitment that they wanted to make. Um, and it all played out, obviously, in the best possible way. Good stuff. Hey, Jimmy, one more point on that. He was talking about Coach Arena. Coach Arena is a first Division Three Hobie Baker winner ever. Uh, oh, at wow. Amherst College. So not only did he play at Amherst, he's been a longtime coach there. And his son-in-law, just because Coach Carvel doesn't want to say this, is James Marcou. He played at UMass, and now he's an assistant coach at Harvard. Wow. Don't worry, Carvel. He's not going to take any of your recruits. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I've taken some of his. I took one at the same time. <laughs> That's great. That's perfect. So looking ahead at this, at this season, Coach, I mean, what – what do you feel like where the team said you mentioned that you guys seem to have brought it together. What are some of the improvements you still want them to make? Well, we, we made big steps in the last couple of weeks. We, we went into Providence and played Obviously. a really, a really solid road game. We were down two to one going in the third. We scored twice to win three to two. Uh, we played them then two nights later at our building. We didn't play great. It was kind of a, you know, emotional hangover. We found a way to come back again and win in overtime. And then we went into Harvard played extremely well, found ourselves down by a goal going in the third. We scored two goals. So the last three games have really, I think this group is is finding their identity and and building trust in it with each other. And mm -hmm. so a lot of strides have been made the last couple uh, last couple games that I was that I was looking for. Um, improvement. Uh, you know we, we have a very good young goalie Michael Robble who is 18 years old. He's a high second round pick uh, for Arizona. He has been excellent at times, and he's had some rough stretches. If we can get him, he's eight, you know he's eighteen. Is this was to be expected? Yeah. Uh, if we can get him, you know, we continue to show our faith and trust in him as we should. He's a phenomenal young goalie. Um, if we can get him at a high level of play, I, I think uh, we're going to be a tough out. I think right now we're number seven in the pairwise, and we're almost you know we're coming into Christmas, and so yeah, pairwise is starting to, to really you know be an honest uh, reflection of where teams are at. And we had, we had a tough schedule. You know, we played Michigan, BU, um, Providence. You know, we've had a tough, uh, I compare our schedule mm -hmm. so far to anybody in the country. Um, and, and we've grinded, but again, I just like where the team's at right now. Yeah. And I look at two, th those comeback wins. I mean, those can unify a team, right? I mean, when you, when you see that and you do that together, I know that it can really unify a team. My question to you as a coach is how do you tell the guys, good job, and I love that we're coming together as a team and we can come back in these games, but don't think it can happen every game. Well, I think we've gone through that experience where yeah. we've, we've won a big game and then the next night it's not there. So all normal progression of – we have 13 new players on this team and not unusual for most college teams these days, but – I think we've got we've had some tough uh, learning lessons. We we gave up a lead to Northeastern at home with under two minutes to go. Right. You know, I think we gave up a lead in another game. So we've gone from giving up leads to finding ways to win in the third period. And, and again, that's just that's the progression that I was hoping to see in this group. Perfect. Well, Coach. I'm going to end this with this. Like, I'm so grateful yeah. to Greg for coming on. It's a game yeah. day. They're at UVM. They want to keep the momentum going. So I'm going to say this because it's hard to embarrass somebody on the air, but I'm going to probably do this. Jimmy, I think that Coach Carvel's the best coach outside the National Hockey League. And I think at some point um, somebody's going to bang down his door and they're going to be very fortunate to hire him. And, and I don't throw that out there lightly. We've had a lot of real good coaches on this show since we started it, and we're going to have a lot more good coaches. Yep. I think Coach Carvel, because of his experience in Anaheim, his experience in Ottawa, his experience at St. Lawrence, now his experience at UMass, winning a national championship, coach, coaching a Hobie Baker winner, bringing a plethora of future NHL players. I think it's just a matter of time before Kent, New York's first ever NHL head coach is going to be on an NHL bench soon. I think it's just a matter of time. Carvey, if you're mad at me, you can call me later. <laughs> no, I, Pierre, you've been my biggest supporter forever, and um, I have – High, the highest respect for you and your your hockey knowledge and our friendship has lasted the, the you know the test of time yeah. and uh, always very grateful and appreciative and 
Derek Lalonde, you know, beat me to it, though. He's the first North Country uh, head coach. But yeah, I don't think he's from Canton, though. No, but he's from, he's from Brazier Falls, where my yeah. dad grew up. So I, I hear it all the time. <laughs> and, 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 Coach, I'll just tell you, you know, when I'm sitting at the Bruins games, a lot of times I'll sit over with the scouts and some of them who are sometimes assistant general managers, general managers there watching. You come up a lot. I'll, I'll just tell you that. So I want you to know that. Like, the, I've had many conversations about what you've done with – with our program there. And I, I'm so grateful as a UMass alum for what you've done. So thank you. Thank you. That's, that's really one of the things I want to do when I came in is just make this huge alumni base proud. And as you said, they, the school has been living off basketball for a long, long time. And, um, you know, that was another one of our goals is to make it a hockey school. This is, this is Massachusetts. This is a hockey state. So we for wanted sure. it. And, uh, you know, our student body comes out and supports us and we've done a good job. Good job. Coach Carvel joining us here well on our on-campus segment on the eye test on the Sick Podcast Network. Coach, good luck tonight against UVM. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Pierre. Have a blast, Coach. Hope so. See ya. Talk to you. He's great, eh? Well, so now you understand why they win. Yeah. So he, he is the personification of winning. Um, I'll never forget going down. I used to go down every Wednesday from Canton, New York, down to uh, Hotchkiss, Lakeville, Connecticut, right near Salisbury, and just watching him. And if they weren't there, and he played for a real good prep school coach, Jeff Kozak, if they weren't there, I'd go find them on the road. It was so critical for our program to get him. It wasn't just about hockey. It was about IQ. It was about passion for the game. Yeah. It was understanding he had to be a good teammate. This guy had it all. I mean, I the first time I watched him play, I was like, whoa, this is not normal. This guy's way ahead of it. And he really was. And eventually, when Scotty and I were in Pittsburgh uh, with Craig Patrick and Bob Johnson, we drafted him on uh, the supplemental draft just because of his character and, and his abilities. Um, can't say enough good things about him. Jimmy, I'm so happy that all you UMass alum uh, yeah. are getting to have fun watching the product as he's helped create. It's great. Well, I'll tell you, Pierre, a funny story. So when they when they wound up winning the national championship uh, in, was it 2021, 2022? When it, so, you know, we were just starting to come out of COVID, remember? Yes. And so there weren't – it was still those um, half crowds. They were doing like just, you know, minimized crowds at, at the tournament. There weren't that many people there. And I just remember I – didn't, I didn't make it – I didn't make it up. But I remember that when they – they got back to Amherst. You know, you ever see the pro teams when they come back and everybody's waiting for them. <laughs> and they were really, you know, they weren't expecting it because people were still really worried about COVID. Everyone was still wearing masks. And they got back and it was about 10 rows deep of fans just waiting for them in that parking lot. You know, the parking lot right behind the Mullen Center. Absolutely. And I, I'm seeing the videos on Twitter. I'm like, this I, I would have, I just would have never imagined it being a UMass alum here. I mean, it, and I was always a hockey guy. So when I was a student there, you know, I, I was doing play by play, covering a team for the collegian there. And, but nobody cared. It was just, it was kind of an afterthought. So to, to now see this, to see what he's done. And that's why I asked him just about the vision and, and what his goals were. And it, it looks like, you know, he's just checking off the marks as he goes right now. And it's great to see. Yeah. And I really think too, Pierre, and this is obviously no discredit to Cal, Cal McCarr, but you he's crediting Cal McCarr about how much he was and what a, what a pro the kid was at a young age there and what a great teammate he was. But I'm sure Greg had a lot to do with that because you can just see the way he talks and everything you just said about the character you saw when he was young, when he was Cal's age, that rubs off. And, you know, that helps mold these kids as they go to the next level. Well, it's just doing the research on the person and everybody sees the player. They don't always see the person. Um, in Greg Carvel's case, the person as great a player and as great a coach, the person's way better. The yeah. person's unbelievable. I'm just telling you, I, I've known a lot of different people in this business for a long time and there are a lot of great ones. This guy's right up there in terms of being a person. He's a phenomenal, right. phenomenal person. I remember when you first told me about him when he got hired and you say, hey, Jimmy, you got a good one coming here. Trust me. Well, today, today I, was like, I feel I'm older, you know, I'm, I'm a little <laughs> older than Carr, So I, I feel like I'm his dad a little bit, even though I know <laughs> his father and mother really well. Big brother, your big brother. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, probably. 
The one <laughs> thing I would say as we go into the end of the show, um, we like to always give accolades to people that help other people along the way. The one person, I'm glad Greg brought it up, Joe Marsh was such a legendary person at St. Lawrence and in college hockey for almost 30 years. He did so much to help mold Greg Carville uh, as a player and as a coach. Mm -hmm. I can't say as a person because Greg's family did an amazing job at that. But as a player and a coach, uh, Joe Marsh played a significant role in what Greg Carville is all about. It's great. And I love the Scotty connection as well. Well, yeah, that, that was easy. Scotty was up watching him play and, you know, we, we were together and he goes, why don't we draft this guy? I said, we will. <laughs> There's that? another thing too, Pierre, I want to bring up and I want to credit you on this too, because you're the one who taught me this. And for all, for people in my business, okay, not just like hockey coaches or players, what have you, but for hockey media too, practice shows so much more about the player. And, and I know, I loved how he said that. And he brought that up because you taught me that a while back. You said, Jimmy, if you want to really evaluate a player and you want to know how, you know, coaches and GMs look at them, start paying more attention to them in the practices rather than the games and see what they do then. And you're so right. Like it, it's it, ever since you said that it's made it so much easier to write about a player and feel like I know what I'm talking about because I just, you see it so much more with it, with their habits there. I watch the way, you know, like, like a, I mean, he's the ultimate example, but I'll bring him up. Not everybody's going to be Patrice Bergeron, but one of the things I used to love was just, I would always just notice him always going up after a drill, going up to a coach and they'll be pointing at something. You can see him asking the questions. What did I do that were on there? How do, how do I improve it? And it just struck me. And then you, you could see the younger kids say, well, if he's doing it, I got to do that. And they fall suit. So you know, I appreciate you telling me that way back. And, and it was it was great to hear Coach say that about Makar was just the practice is what sold me. Coachability is one of the most overlooked things that scouts do. They don't pay attention to how coachable a player is. And, and the only way you're going to find that out, unless you get a ticket right behind the bench of the team you're scouting, which you usually don't want to do, it's a bad seat, um, you're going to want to watch them in practice. And I think that's one of the things – I learned that from Scotty a long time ago and Craig Patrick. And, um, you know, I'm so grateful for the life lessons and the hockey lessons I learned from them. But that's a big thing is how coachable is a player. And the only time you'll really see that is in practice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, OK, so I'll give an example. And he's he's no Patrice Bergeron. But what I've been impressed with since Jake DeBrus started, I want to tell Bruins fans mm -hmm. that's out there too, and yeah. that this will make them happy. Since he decided to stay and all that stuff, the trade requests and everything was out the door. And I, of course, Jim Montgomery and the coaching change had an effect. I'm not trying to discredit that. But I noticed how he took it upon himself to practice harder. And I know he would love more goals right now on the ice. But I'm telling you, that kid is working hard in practice every day and it will come. But you need to be happy about that because the goals just don't happen. You need to work towards it. And I've been really noticing that a lot about Jake DeBrus. So, hey, maybe that's a story idea I'll write this week. <laughs> well, you know what's really cool? College Hockey Fridays is really cool. I'm loving this. We're going to call I, it on campus, right? I think it's right? great. Like College that? Hockey Fridays is really good. Now, we can't give it away because I don't have the confirmation yet. But if you live in the western part of the United States, there's a real good chance we're going to have a very high-profile college coach on next Friday. Now I just got to make it work. So, and, Jimmy, if it doesn't, it's my fault. I'll yeah, it's okay. It. And, and I'm trying to make it work where we're going to have an NHL GM from the same area on. So that's yeah. that's that's we'll stop the hints right there. That's, so that's, that's for all. Wednesday, right? That's for <laughs> yeah. Wednesday. I got to take care of Friday. We already have Monday taken care of. Exactly. The legendary Chuck Caton, the legendary voice that. of the Hartford Whalers and the Carolina Hurricanes, Hockey Hall of Famer. He's going to join us on Monday. He is so excited, Jimmy, to be on. Yeah. He watched he watched the Bowman episode, and he says, oh, man, I got to be on. I got to be on. So that's good. And I hope he's ready because I'm asking some Whalers questions too, Pierre. Okay. Because I, I want to go back to those days with him too because God well, bless the Whalers. He and I used to ride to the airport together and dine out together, and the only thing I couldn't get Chuck to do was go to the gym. I could <laughs> get him to do everything else. I couldn't get him to go to the gym. <laughs> all right well you got to get me in there more we'll, we'll do it all we'll right. do it for sure hey listen great episode Pierre. always a pleasure and you know i do want to when we get a chance go back to our rebuilding discussion there 
because mm-hmm. it's a timeless subject that we can yep. discuss there. But I think it's very interesting because it's changed so much in the cap era. So I want I want to investigate more into that, and we'll we'll talk a little more about what the Habs are doing because I know we have a lot of Montreal listeners. Yeah. And I would just like to thank Mike Carter and everybody at Colgate University for allowing me to use their facility today to be on the podcast with you, Jimmy. All right. I know we're not supposed to be partisan, but go Raiders. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pierre McGuire, Jimmy Murphy here on the ITES on the Sick Podcast Network. We'll talk to you Monday. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the eye test with Pierre McGuire and Jimmy Murphy on YouTube, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.